uh, to our Usomi webinar. And today we are going to talk about how dose tracking uh, impacts the practice of radiologists. And today's presenter will be Federica Zanka. Um, she is a medical physicist with a PhD in medicine, has uh, had extensive work experience in academia and some in the industry as well, and recently started her own uh, consulting um, firm. And um, yeah, um, I think we are going to hear a lot of interesting uh, topics, as you may know, um, imaging informatics is not only about the images, but also about uh, the things connected to the um, process of imaging. And I think really for us radiologists, those tracking is an, a very important issue. And um, I'm very uh, excited to hear what Federica has to tell us. Okay, so good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Daniel, for your introduction. Can you hear me well? Yeah, yeah, everybody. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm very pleased to be able to share my experience uh, about uh, those tracking system. As uh, Dania said, um, I've been working in industry and academic and especially in industry, I've spent some time uh, on uh, those tracking system. Um, I am uh, giving this seminar also on behalf of the Eosomi uh, Society. Um, and I think I will now uh, turn off the video simply because also my network is not very strong and I will probably turn it on again uh, when we have uh, the questions such as at least uh, there is a face <laughs> to whom you can ask the question, okay? Um, okay, so... Uh, the uh, learning objective were shared with invitation. Uh, what I would like, uh, in fact, to share with you uh, is the outline of this uh, presentation. So um, I would like to introduce you to those tracking system, but in a very short way. So I would just spend a few words on why uh, patient dose tracking is useful, what are the dose metrics which are useful or attainable from the system, how are they obtained, and uh, how does it take to install uh, such a system, such a software, and to have it up and running. And uh, most of the presentation, I would say the rest of the presentation, uh, will be covering actional example of uh, those tracking utilization, and especially success, success stories um, in radiology department. <laughs> so I will uh, not with this webinar um, explaining what uh, each uh, uh, and different dosing tracking system on the market can do. I will not do any comparison among them. I really want to pass a message about how this system can be useful through this type of uh, success stories. Um, so, uh, why patient dose tracking system? Well, uh, with the new European directive, as you, most of you probably know, and also joint commission in US, uh, there have been some changes which require those info and, uh, and the transfer of that at the end of each CT and uh, uh, interventional procedure. Uh, it also requires some certification uh, in terms of uh, age, gender, just to mention a few. It requires regular review of DRLs. So, for the question of compliance, having such a system is definitely useful. Uh, there has been res recently also the publication of the ICRP 135, which revised uh, the concept of DRLs in medical imaging and gives a new perspective on the definition of DRLs, which can be leveraged uh, by collecting many data through this type of software. And uh, also, it can be useful for accreditation requirements as a GCI or auditing like the Quadrille. Uh, there are obviously also ethical reasons, like uh, such a system is useful to justify high doses uh, of patients undergoing a, a specific examination. It allows you to optimize uh, protocols, as we will see in the example. It allows you also to uh, assess individual risks, like, for example, uh, those to the conceptus or big skin dose, which are uh, also required. Uh, and it also uh, allows you to increase awareness uh, among the team in a radiology department, like radiologists, technologists, uh, and also to uh, improve patient safety. Of course, it also uh, has uh, uh, other outcomes, like in, in a context of a radiology department, it can help improving quality assurance. It allows to uh, assess patient cumulative dose. It can be useful for research purposes, and I will come back 
on that also. It can be useful for definition of clinical DRLs, just to mention uh, some of them. So these are the reasons why, for example, a patient dose tracking system can be useful. And which type of dose metric are useful or are attainable from such a system. So ideally, one would like to collect organ dose and most of the dose tracking software today do have uh, the feature to collect this information. And also, um, although not relevant at patient specific level, effective dose can also be estimated uh, from this dose tracking system for, for for example, for population assessment. Uh, the problem is that measurement of these doses obviously difficult, uh, direct measurement through dosimeter. So what happens is that uh, uh, computational prediction is done uh, often through uh, Monte Carlo simulation. So when you have this dose tracking system who are reporting organ dose, typically are uh, computational prediction on a voxel phantom or geometrical phantom. So what happens in the reality is that we use those surrogates, which we get directly from the machine, uh, or we get, um, let's say, uh, parameters which we can use to calculate them, like the CTDI vol, the DLP, size-specific dose estimate for CT, for example, or for interventional procedure, like cum cumulative exposure time, the air kerma, the dose area product, and so on. These are easier to obtain, but of course they are more difficult to interpret for uh, radiation, the treatment, uh, respect to direct measurement or computational prediction of those, like for example, the organ dose. Um, the, uh, it's very slow when I go to the next slide, it doesn't uh, react very quickly, so, okay. So the presentation is not responding. Okay, very weird. Okay, let me. Uh, okay, so, um, Paula. Yes. So the, it seems the presentation is hanging. It doesn't uh, uh, move on. So maybe it's you like... Moving your, you're moving your video, right? I'm moving my video, but it's like frozen. It doesn't do anything anymore. Mm, okay. Maybe I, I don't know, I need to restart it or... Uh... No, no, let me, let me try. Okay. Let me try to change the, the video. Sorry for that. <laughs> okay, okay, now I see that he's going, uh, yeah, okay, excellent. Thank you very okay. much. Mm -hmm. So, um, the other point I wanted to briefly uh, told, uh, tell you about was how are these those metrics obtained, the surrogates and also the other calculation. Well, the, the surrogates, we get it from the modalities and, uh, uh, you know, no matter what system you will buy, it will need to be very robust in terms of collecting this data and transform them such that you can compare them across uh, uh, the different vendors. But today we are quite, uh, let's say, lucky because all modern modalities are equipped um, in order, with the capability to export uh, such info from the DICOM structure report, for eventually from the DICOM MPPS, the REM profile. You can also get some of the information from third parties like the PACs and the RIS. For legacy equipment, uh, you have an issue uh, because you need to enter them manually or uh, use the image headers doing OCR, which is not obviously uh, ideal. Um, I would like also to add that in spite of the fact that we talk about those tracking system, most of the system do also collect contrast data information from CT modalities, so not from interventional, and specifically they collect contrast type, concentration, volume, and injection rate, and I will give you an example of that later. So how does it take to install? So now I've told you very shortly what it is, why it is useful, how you collect the information. Let's say you buy one, how does, what does it take to install it? So obviously the first thing is uh, buy the software tool. Uh, the second thing is to connect the software tool to all the machine or to eventually the third parties and start collecting the data. 
then it's very important to check the quality of the data. It is not because data comes in that are necessarily um, correct, especially if you have a legacy system and you apply OCR or other uh, less fancy technique than uh, leveraging the structured radiation report. Uh, and then you need to look also at the user interface. How are your data shown? Uh, are the configuration of your system uh, uh, fitting your needs? Uh, do you have rights for technologies or radiologies which are uh, set up in a different way? You also want to go and check the reporting of that system. So how are the system generating the report? Are this report compatible with the national regulation for dosimetry report? Do you have a specific report, for example, for a pregnant women who undergo a CT exam? Um, once you have checked all this, I would say you can push the button play and start executing and collecting the data. This will probably work for the first month. And then if you don't work on sustainability, uh, it will be very hard to use it on a daily basis. And you might um, at the end end up in using such a system only once a year when you have to provide your dose level at the uh, regulatory bodies, which I guess is not what you want to do, certainly because it is an investment. So to keep this uh, uh, process sustainable on the long term, you will need the help of uh, many people, so you need, of course, a financial investment. You need a strong collaboration all the time with the IT. It is very recommended to engage a medical uh, physicist, physicist expert, especially for the quality of the data, for checking the reporting. You need a strong engagement also for the technologists, which are on a daily basis working on the, on the machine, if you want them to have this dose, dose tracking system open uh, while they are doing the examination in the room. and. Uh, uh, you need also a very good collaboration with the uh, other uh, third IT parties, like, for example, the PACS and the RIS, uh, to be able to integrate, to have the working list in your system. And only then uh, you will be able to go from a simple dose tracking system to real dose contrast management. So uh, what does it take to make it sustainable? I take an example of a project I did with some uh, customer uh, some time ago. And um, well, you need a supporter, so a project driver and a team of people who are engaged, which define a common vision or a common goal over a period, for example. And you need to define processes. Only in this way, you will be able to use the software on a daily basis and to make this uh, um, a sustainable uh, uh, approach. So this brings me my first uh, actionable example um, on the utilization, which is the quality story. This is uh, something which has been presented at RSNA in 2017 and which ended up with uh, um, a paper uh, which has recently been published in European Radiology. It is a collaboration with a Swiss group, uh, Group Roiser and uh, Dr. Bratt, which has been leading uh, in an excellent way the project. And uh, um, what did they do, actually? What did we do together? Well, once the European Directive was brought out, uh, seen the requirement, uh, or some of the requirement, which are the one I shared with you uh, at the beginning of this uh, presentation, so the registration of the dose, radio protection, education, training, um, they decided to buy uh, a dose tracking system. Uh, they are a multi-center uh, um, group of uh, uh, diagnostic practices and uh, uh, when they started collecting the data they realized that they had very large dose variation across the sites, they had pro protocol parameters in homogeneity and they had also a lack of staff, tra staff training uh, regarding radio protection. So they put together a vision as I told you before and uh, they wanted to define a radiation uh, dose optimization and education program across the seven centers, which use different scanners. They wanted to implement a dose culture among the 22 radiologists and 40 technologists. And they also wanted to benchmark their dose level based on clinical indication versus uh, national DRL, which are based rather on anatomy. And I'm going to walk you through this uh, uh, study. So, as I said, they had challenges spread over a quite large re region of Switzerland. Several radiologists, different scanners, different manufacturers. manufacturers. Um, so, how did they start? 
they started by defining the vision, but most of it they started defining by the stakeholders. So they involved the industry, which were different industry, uh, like Philips and G at that time. They had the dose management software, and they involved also the medical uh, physicist expert. They put together a steering committee with a team um, of people, so each side had a dose team and a leader which was represented in the steering committee. And what we did, we did at the beginning a first uh, workshop, a two-day workshop in which we really defined the strategy of the project. So at first step, uh, we decided to work on the protocols harmonization across the seven sites. And in the second step, uh, we work on the protocol optimization and we define the methodology later on. So for the harmonization phase, the objective was to harmonize, not to optimize, only to harmonize the protocols parameters and to be able to collect data from different sites uh, which were representing the same thing, such that we could compare Apple with Apple. And um, what did we do? We used the Radlex protocol and we mapped in the dose tracking system each protocol no matter which name the protocol had in a site A or site B, every protocol was mapped to a unique Radlex code, uh, which allowed us to afterwards analyze the data in a proper way. We also change um, the name of the protocol based on the clinical indication. So for that, we had the, uh, the help of the uh, technical people of the CT scanner uh, manufacturers. And we also split the protocol uh, based on uh, patient BMI, um, less than 25 and more than 25. We couldn't at that time work yet on the uh, water equivalence diameter because it was not yet uh, collected, uh, but we are working on that to change it. And then we, we just, uh, you know, harmonize a little bit the dose values by looking at the Swiss national dose level. And we map the CTDI vol to be close to the P25 for the BMI and just below the P75 for the BMI larger than 25. We then stepped into the optimization phase. There, what we do, we did, we started redu reducing the dose by 12% um, for all protocol. And we had uh, the um, radiology evaluating the image quality. So for that, how did they evaluate the image quality? We used and adapted the European guidelines for image quality evaluation in CT, but use the tool which is part of, the, of this dose tracking system, which integrates uh, an image quality uh, um, interface on the PACS and connect it via contextual call to the dose tracking. So the radiologists could just evaluate the image quality and the data were collected. Uh, based on the number of negative votes, the, the dose was set back to um, the previous uh, reduction level, or we went down and down and down in the reduction until, in fact, we started to add negative votes. This is just an example. Uh, you can see that uh, this is a, a known hypodense focal liver lesion in segment four. And what you can see, of course, this one is that the image quality before optimization is definitely better than after optimization but this didn't impact, uh, um, let's say, the, the needed image quality for a clinical diagnosis uh, um, when considering the image quality as evaluated by uh, the radiologist. So once we have optimized, harmonized the protocol and optimized them, we started collecting those based um, uh, on the clinical indication. I told you at the beginning that we put the protocol name based on clinical indication and we mapped to the Radlex. So what happens is that if we were for chest, for example, showing uh, the different clinical indication, uh, we would have the two uh, type of uh, patient groups below 25 as BMI and above. And you can see in green uh, the P50 of the national DRL and in uh, orange the P75, both for CTDI and DLP. And what you can see is that, in fact, when you consider clinical indication, you are for certain uh, protocol definitely below uh, a DRL, which is based on a region like chest in general, and this especially for BMI larger than 25. So um, it also shows that stratifying per BMI class allows a further uh, optimization.
So in conclusion with this study, with this first example of uh, utilization of a ghost tracking system, uh, what were we able to do? We were able to have a systematic dose record analysis and also able to justify 100% of dose excess. We had a good practice standardization. We were able to reduce on average a dose by 26%, and we were also able to define local clinical DRLs, which are currently used uh, in these multicenters. And of course, this, uh, as I told you at the beginning, through a different step, uh, which are a clear roadmap, leadership, teamwork, regular communication, and also very important the partnership uh, with uh, uh, the stakeholders. Uh, I would like now to go through the second example. This is also a multicenter study, um, which we did uh, um, with uh, the University Hospital of uh, Antwerp in Belgium, of Bruges and uh, uh, Lier, uh, with Timo de Bond and the team. And uh, this has also been published recently in uh, uh, European radiology. So this was uh, the objective of the study was just to benchmark uh, standard practice for pediatric ed CT. Uh, this is the uh, region of Belgium where the three hospitals were situated. And what we did, we just collected the pediatric dose through a dose tracking system during a one year period in three different hospitals. We had five scanners, again, from different uh, uh, manufacturers. Um, we collected the, through the dose tracking system, the dose, the TLP, uh, CTDI, and the scan length. And we analyze the data per center, per age, per clinical indication. And the result, I, I report obviously only a few uh, of them. What is interesting is that uh, the three hospitals were very different. One was a large city hospital, one was a university hospital, and a small regional one. And what you can see is that if this is the DRL in Belgium for uh, that type of examination, you can see that uh, although each site is below the DRL, you can see a large difference in doses between the site, and especially in site C. This was the only site where really there was a, a quality program in place, where protocol well adapted, for example, to the age of the child. And you can see, in fact, that the dose increases with the age, which is not the case, for example, in site A. You could also identify some outliers, which are just adult protocol uh, erroneously selected for pediatric. And uh, uh, what is what came out also, did, what, which I think is very interesting, is that uh, um, if we look at the scan length uh, stratified by age, you can see that the site C, which was the, uh, the one who had the lowest dose and had a very nice protocol in place, had systematically a very um, much higher scan length than the other site. And at the beginning, we didn't understand why. And eventually, we realized that uh, um, this was due to the fact that in that hospital, they had a new scanner, and the scanner had an automatic selection of the scan length. And the technologies didn't took the time anymore to optimize it, so to reduce uh, the scan length. So at the end, this was again implemented and improved uh, improve the practices. So in conclusion of the second example, um, what we found out is that even though uh, all hospitals complied with the national and international DRS, those tracking and benchmarking also, which is very important, showed that further dose optimization was possible. Standardization was possible by using age stratified protocols like Hospital C did. And also it revealed uh, often that adult protocol are still wrongly applied for pediatric patient, a practice that must be avoided and that is currently avoided through training of technologists. Uh, I would like then to show a third example. This is a, an example of technology assessment. Uh, this has been presented uh, again by a Swiss uh, medical physicist, uh, Natalia Saltibaeva, which has presented at ECR 2018. Uh, she did a study on the overranging dose production using dynamic collimators. Um, so, what this, the objective of her study was to assess, uh, you know, you have uh, the, the let's say new scanner have these adaptive collimators which uh, allows to eliminate the dose associated with the overranging due to spiral scan. So due to spiral scan you always have an extra rotation uh, at the end, half rotation, which contributes to a, a let's say a extra scan length which is irradiated depending on the pitch. So this the company have introduced these adaptive collimators which just block this kind of uh, extra uh, radiation. 
we we'll did, we'll do is use a dose tracking system, uh, TQM from Kellum, to collect those metrics and scan length for this exam. And the software allows you to collect, of course, the scan length, the DLP, and the CTDI vol. And they uh, calculated, you know, the DLP divided by CTTI and compared it to the scan length collected by the software. And of course, found that this was different. This is because, uh, of course, these active collimators are uh, in place. So what did they do? They calculate the efficiency, the dose efficiencies of that collimator uh, by making the ratio between the true scan length and the length of the exposure uh, and expressing it in percent. And uh, what they found is that uh, in different uh, anatomical region, depending also on the pitch, these technologies allows a dose reduction, which is maybe not uh, uh, substantial for a certain anatomical region, but can be relevant uh, for other anatomical region, and it is inversely proportional uh, to the pitch. So this allowed, uh, so in this case, uh, the dose tracking system allowed to, for example, to access a technology that uh, you can buy. Then I go through my last example. Um, this is uh, an example, I wanted still to put something on contrast. Um, this is something which has been uh, worked out uh, um, in an university hospital uh, in Belgium, and um, it has been presented at RSNA in 2016. The objective of the study was to improve the patient-to-patient -patient enhancement, CT enhancement in coronary CT angiography, and also to develop an individualized contact protocol based on a body habitus, which we found out to be fat-free mass and the kilovolt. Why did we do that? Because we started looking at the images, and um, by measuring in the aorta, uh, we found that, in fact, uh, by plotting the frequency of uh, uh, cases uh, with uh, the density uh, of the aorta, you find that there is a very large distribution. In fact, what you would expect is that no matter which patient comes in, they should get the needed enhancement for the clinical diagnosis, not such a spread, which is actually twice, uh, um, for, for certain, as you will see, it's twice the range which is needed. So if you look, a conservative target. So they said we would like to have an enhancement of 500. You can see that there are a lot of patients who are over enhanced, which doesn't give really a benefit, uh, added benefit for diagnosis, but you also have patients who are under uh, enhanced, and this you also don't want. So that's how the project was started. So the system, uh, the dose tracking system in that case, uh, collected uh, contrast information. How do you do that? You just need uh, an. Um, a pump which is a class four, so fully integrated with the scanner. Uh, the work list is sent to the to the CT scanner and the protocol injection to the pump and back to the scanner. And then the information are collected and reported in the dose tracking. And uh, uh, we also did the image quality evaluation, like done in other case, again through contextual call from the PACS. And these data are automatically saved in the dose tracking for export. Uh, which methods did we use? But first we studied the influence parameters on the aorta. So we said, okay, why did we have such a large variability? So what I didn't tell you is that at the beginning, when I show you the Instagram with a large variation, is that because every patient was injected with the same volume of contrast. So, and the protocols was identical to each patient. The concentration was the same. So obviously other factor impact the enhancement like the cardiac output, but the body habitus as well. So we started studying what is the body habitus that most impact the enhancement. And also we accounted for tube potential with also impact the enhancement and the concentration of the contrast. Using that data uh, extracted from the software, we developed an algorithm for patient specific injection we implemented. And we suggested, we defined, sorry, a target enhancement of uh, 425 in literature. Actually, uh, they say that for cardiac CTA, 300, 350 is enough, but we wanted to play conservative. And once this data, this new algorithm was implemented, we again collected new data with the dose tracking system and contrast system and validate them. So at the end of the study, I'm not going to explain you um, because of lack of a time how we build this personalized protocol, but at the end of the study, what you can see is that uh, we were able, so this is the standard, so this is the histogram I show you at the beginning, and this is the adapted one, so the personalized protocol. 
you can see that in fact we substantially reduced the standard deviation and we were also able to shift back the peak from 550 to uh, about 400 which is which was our target it is logic that this is not a one column histogram because there are more factors than just the patient habitus like the cardiac output but this definitely improved uh, the image quality um, of that examination uh, it was also very nice uh, to find uh, some dependency on gender. So for female, uh, the dose reduction with respect to the different uh, uh, pro adapted protocol uh, can bring a reduction of 30% uh, of uh, contrast volume injected, while for the men resulted to be much less. So the conclusion of that is that through this study, through collecting this information, we were able not only to optimize image quality, but also to reduce the volume injected. Um, so, and, and as a conclusion of that, I can say that this protocol is, is now used as standard clinical practice in the emergency um, CT of uh, uh, the hospital. Okay, so um, I think that brings me more or less to the conclusion. Um, what's the take home message? Well, uh, I think that if we want to look at how does uh, tracking changes the practice of radiologists, it can help you to bring clinical excellence in your department. And we have seen it through protocol standardization and optimization with image quality. Um, I would like to insist on the image quality because I think it's uh, you can do those optimization without considering image quality. So it's very important to have uh, the possibility to assess that as well. It can uh, help you in risk management. I didn't give you any example of uh, those to the conceptus of, uh, um, but we have, for example, the uh, example of pediatric. Um, you can use the tool also to raise the performance uh, of the staff. For example, the, exa the, the um, uh, study I showed you on pediatric where we had the scan length, which was not adapted by the technologies because they just fully relied on the new technology, new software. Uh, it is very important because it uh, allows, first of all, not to uh, de-skill people, but also to have them engaged uh, during the daily practice. And it also helps to increase the awareness of the team, like the study we did uh, in Switzerland, uh, where uh, uh, the justification of the high doses, uh, the harmonization of the protocols, allowed the technologies to be more aware of their practice. Uh, it can bring you to a better patient satisfaction as a customer of the radiologist. Uh, why? Because it can... Uh, um, you know, a, a patient who has the feeling that is entering an hospital where safety and radio protection is at the center of their value feels, uh, I think, a better experience uh, than uh, in an hospital where this is not uh, um, an important point. And in some cases, for example, it's very useful to uh, make this visible with uh, um, like poster in the waiting rooms. This is very much appreciated. Um, it allows you to give uh, um, more personalized medicine. And I'll give you the example of the contrast uh, protocol optimization of the uh, clinical DRLs uh, related to body habitus. And it also can help you in patient communication and education because you have material that you can use to justify your action and to explain them why you perform a certain procedure rather than uh, um, other. Many of, uh, of the hospital who are, uh, uh, let's say, part of the Eurosafe campaign and become uh, imaging star, uh, use uh, those tracking system. And uh, if you go on the website, you can find a very long list of hospital with, uh, you know, in, on the wall of stars with several stars. Um, and I think this, you know, those tracking system in general have helped a lot uh, the hospitals uh, to go in the direction of uh, support uh, radio protection across uh, Europe, which is one of the objective of the Eurosafe imaging campaign. It can bring an economical value. I say this with a little bit of, uh, let's say, caution in the sense that obviously this uh, uh, software has a cost, but I would say that it's not like an examination with, a, 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 you know, a, 
a, re a payment back to the hospital. So it's a cost and it stays a cost, but it can give you an indirect, uh, indirect economical value uh, through, for example, the possibility to assess um, the new technology that you buy to you know, optimize the utilization of uh, such equipment uh, based on the clinical needs. For example, I didn't show you uh, that example, but uh, uh, there was another study who uh, used uh, that type of uh, software to um, uh, optimize uh, the time of uh, uh, the acquisition of protocol for a musculoskeletal application, allowing, for example, to do more examination uh, during the day, which of course can bring uh, some benefit from an economical point of view. And I've seen some uh, companies who are also working on sending, um, bringing out uh, a tool which uses the information on, in this, of this dose tracking system, for example, to assess uh, the tube life such that you can uh, uh, predict when your tube is going to die and probably already order spare parts uh, not to have a, a downtime of uh, machine. And finally, uh, the last point, I think I brought it through at least a couple of examples, and I do consider this very relevant, uh, benchmarking. So this uh, uh, software really allows you to, uh, relatively easy to benchmark, you, ben ben benchmark your hospital against other hospital practices. And this is a very good way to harmonize practices uh, across Europe, across the world. Um, unfortunately, today there are no, there is no central database uh, in Europe. Uh, there is the database in US, which collects uh, the DIR, which collects uh, CTDI and DLP information. Um, but I think that is something that in the future could come or should come uh, at least. So I would say that. Uh, all this does not come uh, just uh, with a click, so it's not uh, buying a software, install it, and it goes um, uh, on itself. Uh, yes, certain things definitely, like uh, generation of reports, uh, uh, collecting the data, and so on, but it still requires a team, a vision, and a lot of work behind that. So um, also a lot of this tool today, uh, unless we go towards enterprise imaging, do uh, not offer extensive statistical capabilities, which means that uh, in a lot of cases, uh, uh, apart from standard graphs, uh, which uh, show utilization, distribution, protocol uh, comparison for a little bit more advanced uh, um, analysis, you need to just uh, use a statistical tool, like for example, we did in some of our uh, example. Obviously in the future, I think more and more, we will go towards enterprise imaging where also this aspect will be addressed. And with this, I would like to thank you and to invite you all the EUZOMI annual meeting, which, is, uh, which will be held in Valencia, which is also a very nice city, in October. You are also very welcome to send in abstract. I think deadline is uh, in August, beginning of August, and you are very welcome uh, to join us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Federica. That was a very nice presentation. Uh, I see that we have a lot of interesting questions already in the Q&A box, and I would like to uh, just say to everybody that please feel free to add more questions because I think that's a really relevant topic. So one of the first questions uh, by Oliver Diaz is, um, so the dose is provided to the patients in milligray, um, but the question is, do they actually understand what that means? And is there like a reference provided so that the patient can better comprehend what uh, this value means? Do you know any of that? Oh, uh, Federica, you just muted your microphone, sorry. Okay, sorry. Thank you, Oliver, for the question. So, uh, well, obviously, um, we know that uh, uh, for a patient it's difficult to understand the concept as uh, uh, milligray and often, uh, you know, uh, we don't even give that, we give uh, uh, effective dose. Uh, still, effective dose is a concept which is uh, most known by radiologists. It is not uh, a patient-specific uh, uh, metrics of the treatment, uh, but it is still used a lot. So um, what can you explain to the patient? I think if you have to explain it in milligray, that's uh, 
difficult, especially if you have to uh, associate that with, uh, for example, the treatment, the life expectancy and so on. What is understood better from the patient is definitely the concept of, uh, for example, background radiation, which is also measured in sievert, and they probably understand uh, you know, the comparison between a CT scan and a transatlantic flight. Now, said that, I think that a patient, um, so if the question goes also into the direction of do, you, do we put that information in the patient report? Um, and if we put it, what do we put? Uh, I think to that, uh, there is no answer today. So, for example, as you might know, in California and in several uh, states in US, uh, they are obliged to put that information, but they just put the CTDI and the DLP, which for the patient itself is obviously not relevant, but that's the information they have at that uh, uh, moment. Um, so, I don't know if I answered your question, uh, but I think that uh, there is no clear direction on that. Um, I don't know if you have, uh, if you want to comment on that or. Uh... Yeah, Oliver, please feel free to add something, maybe via the chat or something. But I think from my perspective as well, um, like in, in practice, I really like to use the comparison to transatlantic flights. I think that yeah. most of the time really helps. Um, so, but there is more questions coming from uh, Oliver again. So, um, are there any protocols in place if the dose recorded was too high or even if it was too low? So, how do these tools support you with that, and how do you like address these reports then? Okay, so if I don't know if the question is uh, uh, so, if you mean. Um, I guess you mean your protocol, uh, like um, a regulation or, or, or uh, uh, what we have to do. So at, at the level of the yeah. European directing, uh, directive, yes, there is a regulation. It says, okay, every patient who has a, a high dose level, which is above, uh, for example, the DRL, needs to be registered needs to, and needs to be uh, justified and measure needs to be taken to optimize that in case it is not justified. So, for example, there are some cases where the dose given to a patient is way above the DRL, even the P75, but that's necessary. Maybe because the patient is uh, too heavy or maybe because the patient uh, was not collaborative or I don't know for what reason. In that case, the full objective is to get a diagnostic image. And in that case, it is justified to give a higher dose. So that's what the directive uh, uh, says. Okay. Um, I, yeah, I think... Uh, so, and, and in your day to day practice, do you inform the patient as well? or? Well, it depends. So, in general, it, you are not obliged to inform the patient unless it, it's uh, about uh, interventional. Uh, in that case, if you uh, pass the limit, then you need to inform the patient, especially because it can have a deterministic effect like erythema or uh, hair loss mm -hmm. and these type of things. In general, this is something that is. Um, uh, solved, resolved internally in the hospital. So, the, for example, in, a, in general, in the dose tracking system, uh, you have uh, the possibility to justify that uh, high doses uh, by saying, okay, patient not collaborative, patient overweight, and so on, and uh, also to uh, raise an, uh, an alert if uh, uh, there was a, not a reason for that. So in that case, you need, for example, to optimize the, the protocol. And I do expect that maybe then, in general, the dose is higher for all the patients. Mm. Um, and maybe we, before we get to the next question, uh, one question from my side. So uh, in the beginning, you mentioned that there are some regulatory requirements like the new aura at home and yeah. everything. So can you just uh, really expand a bit on what is really required by these laws? Because I think that sometimes these dose tracking softwares provide lots and lots of numbers, but mm -hmm. maybe you get lost between all those numbers and what's really yeah. relevant. What you... Well, in fact, by law, you don't, you are not obliged to have a dose tracking. You can also, so what you need to do is to register the dose of a CT and of an interventional procedure at the end of the exam. Now, if you want to do it manually, it's your business. So the directive doesn't oblige you to have a dose tracking system. Obviously, uh, 
it is very practical to have one because you want to go also behind collecting this. So it requires this. It requires a regular review of the dose reference levels, which means also that, you know, before we were just going to the packs, list 20 patients, unfortunately, only 20, for example, for CT. And these are, were sent to the regulatory body to uh, see if you are in line with the national requirement. Today, um, you could send much more if you have a dose tracking system, which, you know, instead of having you picking up for the lowest exam, you just send the output of your software. Um, so these are the, the things. And then, of course, there are all aspects related to education, training, uh, for example, stratification by age, gender, and, and so on. Right, right. But I think that's really important because obviously it's more about for us as a radiologist to really have that in mind and to have the spirit of optimizing those, even though it's not really needed by law, let's say. But yeah. I think we should really strive in that direction. So another question from Oliver. Um, yeah. In the beginning, you mentioned that the calculations are based on Monte Carlo models. Yeah, um, correct. The question is, how realistic are these? Are they maybe outdated? If they were to be updated, is there a large change in those to be expected? Yeah. And maybe yeah. a question that's related to that, is there like any sort of AI technology involved yeah. in the software too? So, in fact, uh, I, I, I have not put, I had a few slides also on the, on the organ dose and on the different models used, but I thought it was uh, maybe too technical because I know that a lot of radiologists might be looking at the, at the webinar later on. Uh, but the, so the answer is the following. So depending, of course, of, on the model. So how they are realistic, realistic they are. I think uh, there have been outside uh, some software were using like at the very beginning, like geometric models and uh, it has been shown at conferences uh, back four or five years ago that you could have error of 50% so that's not very useful I would say however recently I think all companies have improved in that and they used let's say pre-calculated uh, dose level associated with um, voxelized models and uh, how they are re realistic they are I think uh, um, you have in, in some of the software uh, which are on the market uh, an error bar associated with that, uh, which is based on measurements uh, and, and uh, calculation uh, done previously. And uh, you can see that uh, in general it's within 10% for some of that, but it can in some cases, of course, be um, much more. Now, the question I think is. Uh, um, how do we use, uh, so if you have an organ dose of a, of a patient, how do you use it? Um, I think it's more relevant to consider that data collection to do kind of uh, epidemiological studies rather than uh, on a single patient um, to learn about, for example, the effect of low dose radiation or to have other uh, insights from that type of data rather than focusing on a, on, a, on a single value. And to my experience, the leverage of that uh, organ doses is more used in academic hospital for research, research purposes rather than in general to optimize uh, workflow, radio protection, and so mm. on. Mm -hmm. So maybe another question from my side, and um, please everybody feel free to add your questions. Um, so you mentioned that DRLs are usually associated with anatomy. So I've been looking at the, the national DRLs here in Germany, and I really wondered because like there is a reference level for abdominal CT, but this yeah. may be from, I don't know, very high dose uh, yeah. things for HCC to low dose for renal stones. Is there, or would you think there should be a change in like going towards the direction that you showed in your study to have reference levels for specific clinical questions? Or do yeah. you think that there is a, a still a, an argument to have DDRLs only linked to anatomy? No, I think, I think that's the direction we have to go. That's also what is said in the ICRP 135 that I mentioned at the beginning. So there is a more and more the awareness that, uh, you know, uh, uh, a DRL for an abdomen where the exam is uh, urolithiasis or uh, liver, you know very well that the dose level 
needed is very different among the two. So you don't need the same DRL. So yes, we are going in that direction. From the study that we did, it looked to me that for chest, uh, the differences were not so large, possibly because the chest is mainly air. Uh, I mean, in terms of those, when I use clinical indication, or when I use just anatomical region, alias chest, while for abdomen, indeed, the differences were much more um, important. So uh, I think, yes, we definitely, we will have to go in that direction. And there are indeed already some papers and, and presentation uh, working on that. Mm, cool. And maybe another question, because it's something I was always wondering, um, like, I, I understand that those, those uh, reference, reference levels are on a per study basis rather than on a per series basis, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. Because would it be, would it make sense to have it on a per series basis? Because we could say that each abdominal scan shouldn't be above a certain level because mm -hmm. if I have a four phase CT scan, of course it will have more dose than a single phase, a contrast phase. Yeah. Maybe. And I think, yes, that's correct. And in fact, uh, how the dose is collected in those tracking system is per series and not per exam. And I think going back to the clinical indication will answer this question, because if you do a four phase abdomen for the liver, for example, or you do a non contrast follow up exam for the abdomen, the clinical indication is different and therefore the dose level will be. So I think linking to the clinical indication will partially uh, overrule this. Mm. All right. Um, any more questions? We'll just give it a bit of time. I think I didn't have any more questions. I, I would have uh, also one question. Yes. Uh, concerning uh, these dose levels, uh, are there any specific dose level that are corresponding to age of the patient? Uh, this is the first part of the question. And also, do you think that there should be those levels uh, corresponding to the quality of the scanner that you have? I mean, if you have a very new performance machine, yeah. you yeah. should try to load the dose as much as you can instead of yeah. having nicer images. Yeah. Correct. So to answer the first question, the only stratification um, and difference in age is between pediatric and adult. So it's not like in nuclear medicine where, uh, for example, you administer a certain amount of uh, radionuclide in function of the weight of the patient. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, this is not the case for the definition of the DRS, except, uh, uh, you know, uh, two or three group of ages like, uh, you know, in, uh, uh, baby to one, one to five, and so the class ages, um, but not definitely not uh, for adult. And respect to the question on, on uh, technology, yes, for example, in Belgium, uh, there are some, uh, um, let's say, uh, indication in that direction that, for example, if you use uh, uh, iterative reconstruction, uh, the dose level should be definitely lower. But um, it's not that uh, in all, for example, the so in the in the last uh, one of the last round of those collection, uh, we had to uh, specify if uh, uh, you know the system had iterative reconstruction or not, and this was used for redefining the DRLs at national level. But I'm not sure this is done everywhere in Europe. But it's definitely a point of attention. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, if there are no further questions, then we'll just close the webinar here. Uh, Federica, thank you very, very much. That was, just, I think, a very, very important uh, lecture and a very interesting topic. Um, thank you, everybody, for attending the webinar. Uh, please, uh, again, uh, consider submitting your abstracts to our annual meeting in Valencia and uh, hope to see you around for the next webinar. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank and don't much. forget the next webinar that will be next week on incidental findings. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.